Hey everyone, Daniel here from Next Level Life, and welcome to our fifth and final part of our summary of Robert Greene's book, Mastery. If you happen to miss part four, I'll leave a link to it, as well as a link to the rest of the series in the description below, or you can click on the card in the upper right hand corner of this video. Today, we're going to be exploring the three stages of the mind that every master must go through in their life. We're going to be exploring what each of the stages gives us, as well as why they're all necessary. Let's get started. If we think back to our childhood, and not just the memories from our childhood, but how our childhood actually felt, we quickly realize how different we experienced the world back then. Our minds were completely open. Things that we now take for granted, even things as simple as the night sky or our reflection in the mirror, caused us to wonder. We were filled with questions about the world around us. Colors seemed more vibrant and alive, and we had a powerful desire to turn everything around us into a game, to play with the circumstances of our world. These are qualities of the original mind, one of the three stages of the mind on the path to mastery. The original mind looked at the world more directly, as opposed to through words or ideas that we received. It was very flexible and receptive to new information. So it was a very intense experience, but in a good way. That childlike wonder and engagement is absolutely necessary for coming up with great new inventions or ideas that will move the world forward. Of course, as children, we lacked the knowledge, experience, and discipline to take that childlike creativity and to turn it into something that will make a difference in the world. However, as the years passed, the intensity we once felt diminished. We came to see the world through words and opinions, as well as our prior experiences that we then had. For some, ego started to set in, and we became a little bit more defensive about the world we now took for granted, and may have even become upset if our beliefs were challenged. In essence, we became more rigid, more inflexible, at least in comparison to how we were as children. These are qualities of the conventional mind. And under the pressure of having to make a living, we force our mind into tighter and tighter grooves, and we close ourselves off to the more unconventional ways of thinking, as well as to other possibilities. Through our experiences, we've learned what to do and what to say and how to get by. So the thought process is, if we're already making it work, why change? This thought process only serves to imprison us in the conventional mind. Because, ironically, we now have exactly what we needed to achieve mastery as a child, but we lost that childlike creativity and wonder that was also essential to our success. And in order to achieve mastery, both minds are needed. Masters are simply those who find a way to blend the two. Those who find a way to have the knowledge, experience, and discipline of an adult, but the spirit and creativity of a child. And that blend gives us access to the third stage of the mind, known as the dimensional mind. Now, the dimensional mind isn't limited by its own experiences or habits, because it's always looking at the world with that childlike wonder and asking questions that most people would pass over. Where the conventional mind is passive, consuming information and regurgitating it out in familiar forms, the dimensional mind is active. It transforms everything that it receives into something new and original, basically creating instead of consuming. Of course, at this point, you guys are probably thinking, well, hey, that's great, but if I'm already trapped in the conventional mind, how the heck do I free myself and transition over to the dimensional mind? I'm so very glad you asked, because the way I see it, there are three steps. First, you need to choose the correct creative tasks. Second, you need to actually have productive creative strategies. And third, is where you actually get that creative breakthrough. Now, choosing the correct creative task is of course important because despite what most people think, creativity is not something that's merely intellectual. Most people think that creativity is just a particular way of thinking. That's not exactly true. Creativity is something that involves your entire self. Your emotions, your levels of energy, your character, and yes, your intellect. So to make a discovery, or to fashion a work of art that's actually meaningful, it will inevitably require a lot of time and effort. And if you haven't chosen the correct creative task, one that you'll be fully engaged with, then no matter how brilliant of a mind you have, you probably won't have the patience and the faith to go through all the setbacks and failures that you'll need to go through in order to succeed. So just like your life's task, your creative task must connect to something deep within you, because your emotional commitment to what you're doing will be translated into your work. If you approach your work half-heartedly, it's going to show in lackluster results. Just like if you're doing something primarily for the money, it will translate into something that lacks a certain soul or heart. And even if you don't notice this, others certainly will. 
But if you're excited and maybe even a little bit obsessed, it will also show in your work and it will feel authentic. A couple other things to keep in mind when choosing your creative task is that the task must be realistic. In other words, you actually have to have the knowledge and skills to pull it off. And you're probably going to have to let go of your need for comfort and security because creative endeavors are, by their very nature, uncertain. Even once you know your task, you're still not going to be exactly sure where your efforts are going to lead. Think of yourself as an explorer. You can't find anything new if you're not willing to leave the shore in the first place. And having creative strategies are important because the mind is a muscle, and it's one that naturally tightens up over time unless it's consciously worked on. Why? Because we naturally prefer to have the same ways of thinking because they provide us with that sense of consistency, and people love patterns. And second, whenever we work hard on a problem, our minds naturally narrow their focus because of the strain and effort that's involved. This means that the further we progress on our creative task, the fewer alternative possibilities we'll tend to consider. And I've noticed this happens to me a lot when I'm writing. I'll start off with a sort of explosion of ideas, and I'll be making all these different neat associations. But as I go forward, it's almost like I get a sort of tunnel vision, and I can only see a couple of possibilities at the most. Eventually, I'll come to a point where I just can't go any further because I'm no longer satisfied with what I've got, but I can't figure out a way to fix it. I've run out of possibilities. It actually happened to me once recently with a book I was writing where I just couldn't figure out how to get the main character to work in a story. <laughs> Despite all the neat ideas I had for the world and even the supporting characters, the main character just didn't seem to fit. He wasn't as alive as the rest of the world. Now, of course, like most writers, I'm sure, I tried to force him in there. I tried to make it work, but I just couldn't. I was blocked and it was frustrating, but I knew it had a purpose. I know that many of the masters throughout history have gone through a similar process. They get to a point where the tension in the mind is built up so much, like mine was at that point, that they just can't take it anymore and they have to let go for a moment. They disengage. For some, it's as simple as stopping work and going to sleep for the night, or just taking a break, or temporarily working on something else. It's different depending on who you're talking about, but they all have a moment where they release the tension. And interestingly, what almost always happens in those moments is the perfect solution for their problem comes to them without even trying. I'm sure we've all had that moment at some point in our lives where we've just come to a sudden realization about a problem that we were having, even though we weren't actually trying to solve the problem at the time. It just comes to us, and it's perfect. That's because just below the surface of consciousness, the ideas and associations that we've built up after working on the project we're working on continue to bubble. And without that feeling of tension, the brain can, at least momentarily, return to that initial feeling of openness, which has now been greatly enhanced by all of our hard work. In essence, we have just awoken the dimensional mind. So it seems that the key is to be aware of this process, and to encourage yourself to go as far as you possibly can with your doubts, your reworks, and your strained efforts, knowing that the frustration you're feeling and the creative blocks you're experiencing all have a purpose. So that'll do it for part five, and for this summary as a whole, we're done! And if you happen to be interested in checking out the book for yourself, you can always find it at your local library, I'm sure, or you can follow the link that I'll leave in the description below because there's a lot of good information in this book that I just couldn't get into in this summary. I mean, I did it in five parts because of how much good information there was, and I still couldn't get to all of it. So I do recommend you check out the book for yourself, however you end up getting your hands on it. But with that being said, if you learned something from this video and liked what you saw, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell next to my name so that you'll be notified of all future updates on this channel. I will be doing more book summaries in the future, but until then, everyone, thanks for watching, and have a great day.